people are up to nowadays. So I um, really appreciate it. Uh, so as you can see, I'm going to talk about madness as strategy and mad uh, resistance. And I set my timer here. <clears throat> and as uh, Anne Marie said, I just recently finished a book uh, called, well, it, it was going to be called Mad by Design, Rethinking Psychiatry Outside Dysfunction. And then I thought that was too long. So it's just Mad by Design. But the purpose of the book is to depict psychiatry's history as something like a clash or a confrontation between two different schools of thought or uh, paradigms. One of them I call madness as dysfunction and the other I call madness as uh, strategy. And so today I wanna tell you a little bit about the book, excuse me, but closer to the end, I wanna spend some time trying to situate uh, my project in relation to the movement that's alternately known as mad pride, mad resistance, mad activism, uh, because I do think that they have a, a oneness of purpose. And I wanna begin, I do have some slides and I will get to the slides, but I wanna begin by just saying a little bit about what motivated the project and kind of where it was coming from. Uh, many years ago in graduate school, I had read uh, Jerome Wakefield's classic uh, paper, The Concept of Mental Disorder. And uh, as you know, the, uh, the core thesis is that as a matter of conceptual analysis, uh, disorders, whether mental or physical, are uh, harmful dysfunctions. And the part that's interesting to me here is this idea that when somebody has a mental disorder, it's because something inside of them is dysfunctional. Something inside of them is failing uh, to perform its proper function. Uh, to use more colorful language, something inside of them isn't working the way it's designed to, the way nature intended to, can't do its job, and so on. And one way to argue for that position is through what uh, Edouard Mashery calls this method of cases. Uh, so suppose I give you two lists, and one list I write down things that are generally considered to be mental disorders, schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression. Uh, and then on the other list, I write down a bunch of things that are generally not considered to be mental disorders, jealousy, grief, racism. And then the question is, how, how do these two lists differ? What do the things in the first list have in common that separates them from the things in the second list? I mean, most people think that all of them are, are pretty bad to have. Um, not great, uh, they're distressing, they're socially harmful. I and mean, there's a lot of bad things about everything that I put. Maybe some of you don't think that some of those things are bad or whatever, but you know, they're generally considered bad things. So how do these differ? And Wakefield's view is that if you think about it for a while, you don't even have to think about it for that long. You see that the things on the first list presumably or allegedly come from inner dysfunctions. In those cases, if something in the mind or in the brain just isn't working the way uh, it's supposed to. And I found Wakefield's conclusion pretty compelling. I mean, I didn't necessarily like it, but it, it made sense to me. And uh, moreover, it hangs together uh, pretty well with mainstream biomedical and psychiatric um, usage. So the DSM states very clearly that for something to be a mental disorder, there has to be some kind of a dysfunction. Uh, the, uh, one of the founders of the RDOC project has said repeatedly that mental disorders are uh, disorders of brain circuits. Uh, and this is a view with real history. And if you go as far back as the Hippocratic physicians, you know, 400 BC, there's this text a very famous text on the sacred disease, it's very clear that the author is describing uh, various forms of madness as resulting from the dysfunctional flow of air in the airway. So the idea is that, you know, there's an overabundance of phlegm and the phlegm uh, 
uh, blocks up the airways. And so parts of your brain are deprived of air. And depending uh, which part of your brain is deprived of air, that's going to be a distinctive symptom or distinctive um, uh, form of, of mana. So this is a very ancient view. It's not like a new, you know, kind of a new idea. Um, so a few years later, after reading the Wakefield, I read, I think it was, I'm not sure which one, but I think it was a book by uh, Randolph Ness and George Williams called Why We Get Sick, The New Science of Darwinian Medicine or something like that. And there's this remarkable chapter, chapter 10, I think, and it's called uh, Are Mental Disorders Diseases? And the conclusion that they come to is no, not always. Some mental disorders probably are not diseases. Instead, they're adaptations. In those disorders, there's no dysfunction, Rather, everything is performing its function exactly as nature uh, intended it to. And the example that, or one example among others that Ness uses is depression. And Ness's point of view is that depression actually has an evolved purpose. And its purpose is to help us to detach from unrealistic life goals. So suppose I'm pursuing an unrealistic life goal, uh, you know, I'm 47 and I decide I want to be the world's best drummer and I've never had any drumming lessons, but I think I have a natural knack for it. And I just repeatedly am frustrated in my goal. Uh, eventually, if everything's working right, depression is going to set in and depression is kind of nature's way of saying, okay, Justin, let's, you know, let's consider some alternate uh, life goals. And so when I first read that book, well, I guess my first thought was, oh, this is adaptationism. You know, I don't like adaptationism. I, kn I know about that. I've read, you know, I've read Gould and Lewinton. You know, I know that you can't justify these, uh, you know, uh, evolutionary just so stories. And so I went through the kind of um, that reaction. But then my second reaction was, it seemed to me that Ness was doing something very radical and in fact, even subversive of this whole biomedical paradigm because he was trying to give us a way of doing exactly what I, what I recommend in the probably now no longer existent uh, subtitle of my book. He was trying to encourage us to rethink psychiatry outside of dysfunction to give us a totally different lens uh, for thinking about uh, uh, psychiatry. Again, at least sometimes when somebody's mad, everything's working exactly the way that it's supposed to. And so after, after reading that and, and reading some other authors, evolutionary authors who thought the same way, I started to wonder, well, has anybody else thought this way? Has anybody else in the whole history of psychiatry, I guess you would really call it the history of madness because we're going even back beyond before, you know, when psychiatry was an organized uh, scientific discipline. Has anybody ever had the audacity to suggest that some mental disorders have some forms of madness, have purposes, have functions, that, that they're not um, dysfunctional? And the first person that came to mind was Freud. Uh, now, I'm no Freud scholar, but I do know a little bit about his work. Uh, you know, leading up to 1920, after 1920, it gets a little bit hazy for me with the death drive, but I know what's happening in Freud uh, before that. Uh, and the basic conception, at least then, and maybe this was all his life, was, was the following. Uh, in our minds, we have certain desires that are so reprehensible, they're so hideous that if we actually were forced to confront the true nature of these desires, it would be catastrophic. It would be devastating for a whole sense of self. Uh, and, and, but so luckily there's this psychological mechanism and its job is to repress those, to prevent those desires from becoming uh, fully conscious, 
But this creates a new problem. The new problem is that these forbidden desires, they're desires too. And as desires, they strive to be fulfilled. They demand to be fulfilled and things are gonna start going wrong uh, if they're not fulfilled. Uh, and so there's a second psychological mechanism that has the function of arranging for the deviant fulfillment of these desires. In other words, uh, fulfilling these desires, but in a kind of distorted or a partial or a symbolic way, in a way that prevents the mind from ever becoming consciously aware of their true uh, content. And the interaction of these two mechanisms, that's what explains dreams, that's what explains slips, slips of the tongue, slips of the pen, uh, that's what explains jokes, and ultimately that's what explains the various forms of madness. And there's this wonderful paper that he has uh, early, early on, uh, 1894, so this is before a lot of his core, you know, doctrines, the Oedipal complex, where he says very straightforwardly uh, that there are three main kinds of madness. There are three psychopathologies and each one uh, represents a strategy that the mind uses to bring about the deviant fulfillment of these unconscious ideas or uh, experiences. Uh, but the point is that each one is a strategy. Each one serves a function. Uh, it's not dysfunctional. And the goal of the healer when confronted with a person with, with a severe mental disorder, your goal is to figure out, okay, which, what's the function? What's the purpose of this particular form uh, of madness? And in fact, in, in some of Freud's work, he even uh, warns us repeatedly, warns his colleagues not to mistake a functional performance of the individual for a dysfunctional one. And, I'll put it, you know, paraphrase the point. Uh, he says to his colleagues in medicine, look, I know sometimes when you're confronted with somebody who's acting in a very bizarre way, you're inclined to think that there's some kind of a dysfunction. But I assure you, in a lot of these cases, there's a function, not a dysfunction, and you can't confuse these two different things. Don't call something dysfunctional when it's actually functional, because then you're going to miss what's going on and you won't be able to heal them uh, 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 properly. So it, it seemed to me that there is this very deep similarity between Freud uh, on the one hand and at least some of the evolutionary psychologists on the other. Uh, and so I came up with some labels or names for these alternate paradigms. And the first paradigm, I call it uh, madness uh, as dysfunction. This is the paradigm that Wakefield gives voice to, the paradigm that Bors gives voice to, that the RDOC and the uh, DSM give voice to. Uh, it was a paradigm that was dominant during uh, the era with that, that the historians call uh, German imperial psychiatry in the late 19th century. People like um, uh, Wilhelm uh, Griesinger, uh, John Haslam, Kant, uh, Hippocratic authors, you know, it's a very long and kind of venerable uh, tradition of thought. Uh, and the second paradigm I call madness as strategy. And this names whatever it is that Freud and at least some of the evolutionary thinkers have um, in common, namely that when you're looking at a mental disorder, the question you should ask is, what's the purpose of this? What's its function? What's its uh, goal? And you should at least entertain the idea that in certain forms of madness, there's no dysfunction. Everything's working exactly the way it's designed to. And so my next question, and now I'm about, about to get to the, the slides. My next question was, well, who else? Who else in the history of uh, psychiatry has, has thought this way? And I started working backwards to, through some of these classic texts in the history of psychiatry, history of, of madness, some well-known, some uh, obscure. And I discovered that this madness as strategy paradigm has a kind of venerable history in its own right. And I, I do think that uh, we can, with some justice, depict uh, 
the history of madness as a kind of debate between the proponents of madness as dysfunction and the proponents of madness as a strategy. So now I, I want to just go ahead and jump right into this, uh, to, the, to the history. I mean, of course, uh, I'm, 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 I'm tempt tempted to spend the next half hour saying, saying a lot of very abstract things about this distinction, but I think it's better to just dive into the history, allow the history to speak for itself. And then at, at, at the end, I want to come back and uh, say some things about mad resistance. So now I'm doing the screen share and uh, hope this works out as it's supposed to. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, so let me uh, move on to talk about some of the major uh, historical figures that I think fit in this, into this tradition I'm calling Manus as strategy. I'm going to start somewhat uh, arbitrarily with Robert Burton and his 1621 treatise, The Anatomy of Melancholy. Uh, and, and if you haven't looked at it, it is a brilliant, weird, funny, kind of outrageous uh, book. It's definitely worth reading. I think it's the kind of thing you want to read till you just get exhausted and you have to just put it down forever. Kind of like Foucault's History of Madness, you know, great book, brilliant book, and you just read it. And then at a certain point, maybe a third of the way through, you just get exhausted. Not just exhausted, like, okay, I got to put this down now, but I have to put this down forever. And that's kind of like Burton's uh, uh, book. But uh, so, so for Burton, I mean, in what sense is madness a strategy? Well, madness for Burton is always a divine strategy. And in his point of view, and a very common point of view in the Renaissance, is that all forms of madness are either caused by God or they're allowed by God. And so it's always legitimate to ask, you know, when confronted with a mad person, what's the purpose? What's the end or goal of this particular um, form of madness? And for Burton, madness has two main goals, to punish but also to redeem. And so the first part is punishment. Uh, and I, I don't just mean it's a, it's a punishment for a, a sin, like a, a, lap, a momentary lapse, like I cheated on my taxes or something. It's a punishment for a habitual pattern of indulgence in a certain kind of uh, uh, vice. However, madness is not merely a punishment, but in, in, in the form that madness takes, there is going to be some kind of an opportunity for redemption. In other words, the, the form of madness is supposed to function as a kind of mirror to allow the person to see very clearly the nature of the underlying vice uh, that gives rise to it. And I think for, for Burton and for generally a lot of these Renaissance uh, uh, thinkers, uh, these two purposes of madness really correspond to the two aspects of God's character, God's justice and God's mercy. God's justice demands that sin requires punishment uh, of some sort. Uh, somebody's got to be uh, got to be punished. Uh, but God's mercy demands that in the nature of the uh, punishment, there's there's some kind of an opportunity for redemption, whether the individual or, you know, for the community as a whole. And I think in some limited uh, ways, the real uh, paradigm of madness for, uh, for Burton is Nebuchadnezzar. And if, if you remember the ancient uh, story, Nebuchadnezzar was this Babylonian king. And at one, one day he looks at his vast empire and he says something like, look at, the, look at the, what my hands have created. And then he likens himself to a god. And then at that very moment, he's struck with madness. And for seven years, he's under the delusion uh, that he's a beast of the field eating grass with the other beasts of the field. But then seven years later, he has this moment of lucidity. And he looks at everything that happened. And he said, I can't believe how how awful, I can't believe what unspeakable arrogance that I had, that I equated myself uh, to God. 
And then at that moment, he's healed entirely and, you know, he goes on to have a happy um, uh, life. Now, I think that for Burton, madness is quite unlike the, the way it's depicted uh, in Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible, because for Burton, Burton has a much more naturalistic, it's still, it's in this theological context, but it's this more naturalistic pic picture, wherein madness, and this is something that uh, Jennifer Radden has written about uh, a lot, madness results from a repeated indulgence in a certain pattern of vice. And over time, that vice kind of becomes crystallized. It takes on its own life in a way. And that crystallized vice is itself a form of madness. And so he, he describes, he, he asks, you know, how does maniacal fury come about? How does somebody become a maniac in the proper sense of the term? Well, what happens, he thinks, you have an ordinary person who gets angry, and instead of choosing the path of forgiveness like they should have, they kind of ruminate in their anger, they stew in their anger, they kind of, um, you know, they, they keep thinking about the thing that made them angry, and every slight, every insult just, you know, enrages them further and further, and ultimately this anger becomes kind of a constitutional principle of their being, and that itself is a form of madness. Okay, so uh, a second thinker that I would put in this uh, tradition is another wonderful thinker in the wonderful book, George Cheney, with his book, The English Malady of uh, 1733. Uh, sorry about this. All right, so uh, for, for uh, Cheney, melancholy, what he calls spleen or vapors or uh, lowness of spirits. Like for Burton, it's, it's a punishment, but it has this uh, redemptive quality. But for Cheney, the sin which uh, th that kind of loomed largest in his thinking was the sin of gluttony, intemperance, immoderation in what you eat and drink, eating too much, drinking too much, eating and drinking too much of the wrong things. And you might think, well, why, <laughs> why gluttony of all the morally heinous things people do, murder and adultery and, and theft? I mean, why is eating and drinking too much? Why is that like the thing uh, that really um, uh, fires him up? And it actually took me a long time to figure out. My point of view is that you can't really figure that out unless you read, you put the English malady in the context of Cheney's work uh, as a whole. And this is a kind of side note uh, on, on the history of science. A lot of historians like Roy Porter will present Cheney as somebody who uh, had kind of historically made the leap. He has departed from the religious orientation. He's entered the world of nerve physiology. And he's doing this kind of modern nerve oriented uh, psychiatry. And that's utterly false. And if you look at his work in the larger context, you can see exactly why that's false. Most of Cheney's work was not actually works of medicine. It was works of natural theology. His very first book is this massive uh, uh, philosophical principles of religion. And then his last book, or one of his last books, is another massive uh, called Essay on Regimen, but it's not actually on regimen, it's on natural theology. And both books are supposed to demonstrate how God's existence, God's power, God's nature is evident in the natural world and, and the level of galaxies, stars, ecosystems, the human body, atoms, molecules. Uh, and the one historian who I think has really, really nailed this is Anita Guerini. And she sees very clearly that Cheney's mission is a fundamentally a religious one. It's not the birth of you know, nerve physiology or nerve psychiatry or whatever. Uh, so at any rate, uh, forget about the historians. Why intemperance and gluttony? Here's why for Cheney, a basic picture is this. God puts different people in different parts of the globe, and then he gives those people exactly the kind of food and medicine 
that they need in order to survive and thrive, given their lifestyles, given the climate, given their ecosystems, given what they have to do to make a living. And so when he looked at his countrymen in England and just saw them importing massive quantities of food from all over the world, spices and sauces and dessert wines and heavy meats, and you know, indulging themselves, I believe that he saw it as a very kind of pure form of rebellion against God's kind of regional uh, um, uh, providence. Sorry, there we go. Uh, but once you have this kind of religious perspective in mind, one thing that really stands out about his, his book is, is he makes this comment to the effect that God never allows melancholy to take a person all at once. Rather, God allows it to take a person in stages of progressive severity. So suppose that I indulge in overeating, uh, over drinking, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna feel fatigued, I'm gonna feel tired, I'm gonna feel lethargic, achy, depressed. God has designed my body that way so as to get me to stop doing uh, that kind of thing. But if I don't stop and if I don't turn it around, then I'm gonna experience a second degree of severity. And that's gonna be more intense depression, more intense fatigue, more intense aches, another second opportunity to turn it around. If I don't turn it around, then you get the third degree of severity. And this is uh, accompanied by hallucinations, delusions, suicidal ideation. And you can only hope that the physician can, you know, uh, bring you back once you've hit that, um, hit that uh, stage. Okay, I'll move a little more quickly, but uh, uh, a third thinker I would put in this tradition is uh, Johann Christian August Heinroth. He was, uh, I believe, actually the first chair of psychiatry in Germany, maybe in Europe uh, as a whole. And he too wrote this massive uh, textbook, uh, something like the disturbances of, of mental life. And it's like an 800 page textbook. And much of it reads as a fairly standard medical, biomedical, even dysfunction centered uh, textbook. But then about 300 pages in, you get to this one it's, you get to this one particular form of madness, and it, it's, luckily there is an English translation, and it's translated uh, as insanity with dementia and rage. And he describes it very clearly as a coping mechanism. That's all it is. It's just a way of coping with really terrible uh, experiences. And here's what he has to say. In a life which has been depraved by neglected education, circumstances, guilt, he describes all these terrible things about how a person's life can go. In such a life, a moment may come where the measure is full and runs over and the imagination becomes strained to the limit and trying apparently to effect a full compensation and to transform the evil fate as though by the touch of a magic wand. So, He's describing a person who enters into a kind of delusional or dream world for the sake of buffering themselves from a traumatic um, uh, experience. And then he goes on to give what I think is one of my top two favorite quotes in all of psychiatry. He says, in the best of cases, the disease acts as a storm which clears the atmosphere a wholesome desire of nature to cure a perversion through another perversion. So there's this deper, uh, perversion of having a terrible life. And then there's a second perversion, namely the perversion of the men mental faculties. And that actually has the function or goal of healing uh, the first uh, perversion. And I think that one thing Heinroth is doing here uh, is that he's suggesting a very new kind of role for the physician and healer, namely that when you confront somebody who, who's having this kind of an episode, you're not trying to stop it from happening. You're not trying to stifle it with drugs and bleeding and purging and vomiting and chains and you know throwing them in, in, in a dark room. Your job is to allow the disease to run its natural course. At best, you're trying to help the disease 
to achieve its natural end and to make sure it just doesn't, you know, get out of hand, make sure that it doesn't become uh, chronic. Uh, another person I think we can easily talk about in the same breath is Felipe Pinel. Uh, Pinel is, of course, uh, famously said to have uh, broken off the, the chains of the mad patient at the Bisset Hospital in Paris. I don't know if that's true or may, like his assistant did that or, or something like that. Uh, but uh, Pinel, um, if you ask a historian, you know, he wrote this treatise in 1800, the, the treatise on insanity. And if you ask a historian, okay, what, what is this person known for? We'll say he's known for the moral treatment. He's known for recommending uh, that the mad not be uh, kept in chains or in prisons or in cages, but rather they're treated with as much humanity, as much civility as possible, given, given the limitate the kind of intrinsic limitations of their mental uh, as their mental state. Uh, and, and though he is well known for uh, this, um, this moral uh, treatment, what I found fascinating reading him is that his moral treatment is actually grounded in a much more fundamental vision of at least certain forms of madness as having a function or a purpose or having some kind of adaptive value uh, for the organism. And in particular, uh, his textbook is about 250 pages. In the first 50 pages or so, he's just describing this one kind of uh, ailment. And he calls it uh, manie periodique. And it's something like intermittent attacks of maniacal fury. Excuse me. And when he's describing this, he makes what I think is an absolutely shocking claim that these attacks actually have a healing cathartic value. They're meant to happen and it's, and it's a good thing uh, when they happen. And one of the chapters of his book, and um, I apologize to my uh, French colleagues or all of my colleagues if I if I mistranslated the, the gist of this uh, uh, passage, but the, the chapter is called something like motives for regarding most attacks of mania as the effect of a salutary and favorable reaction for healing. They have a healing uh, quality. And immediately he likens himself to the German physician, Georg Stahl. Now, Georg Stahl's claim to fame is that Stahl was one of these people who said that fever is not actually a disease. Fever is part of the body's healing mechanism. It's an adaptive functional response to disease. You don't want to stop fever. You want to allow the fever to reach its natural uh, end. And Pinel effectively in this chapter, he says, I'm just like Stahl. I'm doing for this form of madness what Stahl did for fever. I'm revealing this particular form of madness to have a healing and salutary uh, uh, quality. But this teleological perspective, this madness as strategy, leads him, I think, very naturally to the moral treatment. Because if these attacks of fury have some kind of a healing or cathartic quality, then the last thing you'd want to do uh, from a phys physician's point of view is to give the patients to try to stop it. Drugs, bleedings, pur uh, purgings, vomiting, throwing them into a dark room, you know, forcing medication down their throats. Uh, rather, you want to allow the, epi you want to just create a kind of safe environment for the episode to, you know, fulfill its natural course, make sure it doesn't get out of hand. And he makes this very funny quip at one point where he says, I've sometimes watched these mad patients bled so profusely that I don't know who the madman really is, if it's the patient or if it's the, uh, the doctor. And I actually think he meant, meant that. I don't think he, that was like a rhetorical you know, flourish. I think he kind of meant that, but okay. So uh, 
Finally, uh, we come to Freud. And as I said, I won't go back into Freud in any real detail. Uh, Freud's view of, of madness is thoroughly uh, teleological. He sees each form of madness, again, at least early on, as different strategies that the mind uh, uses to fulfill these forbidden desires in a kind of roundabout uh, uh, way. OK, so now I'm going to have to be a little more selective. But the, the person that I want to say a few words about is uh, Frida from Reichman. And she was working during the 20s, 30s, 40s. She was trying to bring uh, psychoanalytic insights to the treatment of uh, schizophrenia. And her core theory was that schizophrenia is just a coping mechanism. That all, that, that's all. It's just straightforwardly a strategy that a person uses to withdraw from a painful social environment, and specifically one in which either they're rejected, and you know, early on they, they, they're rejected, or they perceive themselves as having been rejected repeatedly uh, in early life. And in a sense, sch schizophrenia is eminently reasonable. It makes perfect sense uh, that somebody would want to withdraw from society. And all the, the delusions, the thought disorder, the incoherent speech, or the uh, catatonic withdrawal, those are all just strategies that the mad person is throwing at you to put up a buffer between you and them. And she was, I mean, not consciously, of course, but that this is just what they've been doing for so long. It's second, second nature. And she was convinced, this was her whole point of therapy, that your job as the healer is just to be a kind of affirming, loving, uh, approving presence in the patient's life. And she thought that if you took on that role, then eventually the patient would come out of their shell. And she thought, <laughs> theoretically, in her mind, they had to, because a person with schizophrenia who's kind of withdrawn from the world still has a social instinct. They still long for a social interaction, but they're just scared. And so they need to, they need some time to kind of let down their, uh, let down their guard. Okay, so I'm gonna skip ahead a couple folks, Harry Stack Sullivan, who I think is really cool and interesting. Kurt Goldstein, of course, super interesting. Uh, I, I'm just going to say something briefly about the DSM-1 of 1952, and then I'll come back around to the issue of mad pride, mad uh, resistance. Uh, so what I'm calling madness a strategy, and in particular, this, this Freudian view that the various forms of madness are strategies for dealing with internal or external stressors, this is actually the conceptual foundation of the DSM-1 of uh, 1952. Uh, uh, the DSM-1, and I, I had no idea until, until I uh, kind of recently how much a part of the DSM-1, this basic kind of madness strategy point of view really is. The DSM-1 divides up all of the non-organic mental illnesses into these three kinds, the psychotic, psychoneurotic, and personality. And it explicitly describes each one as a different strategy that the person uses. Again, un unconsciously, they're not aware that they're doing this, a different strategy that the person uses for coping with stressors, stressful circumstances, inner or outer stressors. And so, um, uh, uh, so the, the first of these, the psychotic reactions are, are those in which the personality and its struggle for adjustment to internal and external stressors utilizes severe affective disturbance, profound autism, and withdrawal from reality, and or formation of delusions or hallucinations. Uh, so it's just a coping strategy. And the way that I actually see the history of DSM, and this is again kind of a side note, excuse me, it seems to me that Really, the most important edition of the DSM is actually the DSM-2 of 1968 and not the DSM-3 of 1980, because the DSM-2 is when you really get this self-conscious attempt 
to purge the DSM of these teleological elements, to purge the DSM of these Freudian elements, and to present psychiatrists with a manual that is truly, uh, as they said, atheoretical, that anybody could use, whether you're behavioral, uh, you know, biologically oriented, psychodynamically oriented, everybody could use the manual because you weren't uh, loading it with all of this kind of Freudian uh, theory. And it was the DSM-2 that really tried to turn that around. I see the DSM-3 as really kind of a mop-up job. It was completing a task that the DSM-2 was never able to complete. And interestingly enough, Robert Spitzer, who was, of course, the head of the task force for DSM-3, had a big role in designing the DSM-2. And all of these arguments about how we need an atheoretical manual, we need to get rid of all the references to psychoanalytic concepts. I mean, all of those are taking place uh, in the mid 60s. So uh, one thing though, that the DSM-3 does that I think is very um, novel is that it explicitly says that the various forms of mental illness are just so many different kinds of dysfunctions. It says right at the outset, mental disorders involve psychological, behavioral, or biological dysfunctions. And so as I see it, the DSM-3 represents this kind of temporary, I think, but a, a kind of temporary victory of madness as dysfunction over madness as uh, strategy. Okay, so hopefully I've said enough to convince you that madness as strategy uh, is a genuine tradition and, and that you know we can with some justice uh, look at the history of psychiatry from this, uh, th this vantage point. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna begin wrapping up. Um, okay, so uh, I, I wanted to take the last several minutes just to say a few words by, uh, by way of trying to situate my project in relation to the movement that's alternately known as mad pride, mad resistance, mad activism. Uh, and as I said, I think there's a real unity of purpose between my project and uh, mad resistance. And I think in some ways, my project can be useful for furthering, uh, or to, furthering the task of providing conceptual or intellectual foundations uh, for that uh, movement. And in this connection, I've learned a lot from uh, Ginger Hoffman and Mohammed Rashid, and I definitely can't do better than, than what they've already done, but I'll just say a couple things. Uh, here's how I see the connection. One of the basic tenets, uh, not the only one, but one of the tenets of Mad Pride is this. As mad people, we have the right to explore our identity outside of a certain kind of medical understanding. As mad people, we have the right to explore our identity outside of a certain kind of medical understanding. And this tenet really can be broken down into two different wings. A, as mad people, we have the right to uh, not or to stop grounding our identity exclusively in terms of the specific kind of medical understanding. And B, as mad people, we have the right to begin grounding our identity in other understandings, non-medical uh, or at least not medical in this special uh, sense. And I think that my project can speak to both wings of that tenet. Uh, it speaks to the first wing. We want to stop grounding our identity solely in terms of a specific kind of medical understanding. Uh, and that's because my book tries to identify very precisely this thing, this specific kind of medical understanding that we're trying to uh, move away from, and that's madness as dysfunction. As I see it, that notion of dysfunction, the idea of a, a faculty or a mechanism that's not able to perform its proper function, 
that strikes me as the connecting link that joins together our doc and DSM and, and uh, you know, Wilhelm Griesinger and Haslam and Kant and, and the Hippocratic uh, uh, physicians uh, of old. Moreover, I think a virtue of my project is that it lets us see that the thing that we're trying to get away from is a specific historically contingent tradition of thought. It's not a disembodied ideology. It's not just a system of ideas. It is a tradition of thought that can be anchored to specific individuals who lived and wrote uh, at specific times. And I think it's a very powerful thing to be able to see something as a specific historically contingent tradition, because I think it allows you to move around much more easily within it uh, and to move outside of it. And if you're wondering why I have a map of Heathrow, I, I was thinking about, okay, what's a good analogy? Well, it's getting lost in Heathrow Airport. I hate Heathrow. I mean, I just, I, I hate it uh, passionately. I always get lost. I always miss my flight. I just, I mean, I'll pay not like not to go through um, Heathrow. So I imagine like, suppose you're just trying to get to your gate or just leave the airport and you're at Heathrow and you're kind of wandering around. And then finally, you, you're, you, you know, you're confronted with this map of the whole thing. And immediately you can say, okay, I know how to get out of here. You go this way, then that way, and that, that way. And that's, I think, kind of what, when you can see Manus's dysfunction as a specific tradition that's anchored to specific individuals, it's kind of easier to uh, move around. And then the second wing of this tenet uh, of mad pride is we want to begin grounding our identities in something outside of this specific medical uh, understanding. And I really want to be cautious here uh, because it seems to me that a real virtue of the mad pride movement is the way that it tries to be very pluralistic and very inclusive. There's no doctrine Here's how you have to think of mad. Here's what it means to be uh, mad in this day and age. Uh, there are a lot of different visions of madness um, uh, emerging. So for some people, madness is connected with spirituality. For some, it's connected with you know, political resistance. For some, it's this idea of dangerous gifts. Uh, for some, as uh, uh, Rashad have said it's it's a kind of uh, survival narrative. It's part of the survival narrative. You know my uh, delusions, my hallucinations, my anxiety, my my uh, depression. It's a buffer that I've had to create to cope with this whole series of traumatic experiences or uh, experiences of social uh, injustice. And so in that context, what I call madness as strategy should really be seen as one specific but not exclusive way of thinking about what it is to be mad outside of this medical understanding. In other words, it represents one way of grounding one's identity as a mad person outside of this uh, madness as uh, dysfunction. And uh, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Justin. Thank you. We are now going to have oh, time for sure. questions. So um, if you'd like to ask a question, please um, send your name or a little sentence in the chat so we can see you appear um, one by one. There is one question from uh, Richard Gibbs. Hi, thanks. I've got one. Well, I've got two, but I'll ask one and then you can tell me if I've got time for the other one. So um, thanks, Justin. Um, I can't see you. Let's just get back. Um, uh, yeah, you, you might find this question, if you're more Quinean than I am, you'll find this question kind of boring, Like, but but I'll just ask it anyway. So like, it just, it, are we talking about different views of how madness is caused, let's say? Uh -huh. um, or are we talking about different understandings of what it is to be mad? I mean, they're not, you know, it, it, if to the extent that the cause might be part of what it is to be mad, then of course they can collapse together and so on. I'm just kind of wondering, you know, in other words, does, 
is there something important that we might lose and not a very idea of what it is to be mentally ill if we lose you know the uh strategy idea you know for example in, or one might we think the concept of mental illness is a kind of family resemblance concept it's kind of got kind of perhaps it's got some core of like you know rational kind of disturbance but partly that might be you know kind of um uh, um you know strategically irrational strategic irrationality let's say or collapse of mental function in the service of preserving kind of life or that's the self and, and partly it might just be breakdown so so is, I, I guess i'm wondering yeah, how, how much you kind of offering us a kind of a, a view of different views about what causes what leads to madness and how much you're offering us a, a view of different views of what madness is but like i said if you're more quinian than i am you might think that kind of no you know, I don't, kind of distinction is not very interesting no i don't think it's a. Uh, uh, you know, boring or, or an unimportant question. But let me just make sure I understand you. Are you saying when I when I say madness as strategy versus madness as dysfunction, do these labels describe different conceptions of what madness is versus just different, excuse me, causes? Is that is that are, are they are they integral to at least some of our very understanding of what it even means to be mad, to be, to be properly ascribed, you know, mm -hmm. to, to the word mad to be properly ascribed of us? Mm -hmm. um, or, or are they, as it were, just different ways that one could end up being mad? And you can learn what the word mad is without even knowing anything about strategy or, you know, maybe even about dysfunction, for I know, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. I actually haven't, I don't know that I, let me think about that for a minute. Have I thought deeply about, are these, I think they call them causally relevant or constitutively relevant. Um, I guess I, I've been thinking of them as fundamentally, okay, here's, I'm just going to throw this out. I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to throw this out. This is my thoughts right now. That the notion of madness is intrinsically a kind of vague, somewhat undifferentiated notion. It's something that everybody seems to vaguely have a grasp of when somebody is mad or acting mad. And so it's a kind of amorphous, vague idea. And madness as strategy and madness as dysfunction are two different ways of, of theorists trying to understand what this thing is perhaps not just what causes it, but what is this thing in its, in its very uh, nature? Let me just run with that idea. And one group of people saying uh, this thing, this somewhat vague amorphous thing that we all seem to have this kind of rudimentary, children seem to have this rudimentary grasp of, um, what it is, is, is essentially a disease. It's essentially a defect. It's a product of a defective mind. That's what the thing is. It's a disease like uh, other diseases. And then this other point of view says, no, it's an adaptation. It's a function. It's a, it's a strategy. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to say, though, that in the, even in the strategy cases, that th th there is still something which is um, disordered in virtue of which, you know, the, the, it's thinking of them as mad, some kind of rational disorder, for example, it might be emo emotionally, motivationally intelligible, but nevertheless, what's motivation intelligible is that I needed to break down because I couldn't bear reality, you know, I, I needed to, as it were, to become, to lose touch with, to lose my rational grip on the world, because that very grip was what was kind of so kind of disturbing for me, and overwhelming for me. Yeah. I guess I would be very hesitant. I mean, if I'm following your point correctly, I would be very hesitant to say, well, really, when it comes down to it, all forms of madness involve a disorder or a dysfunction, whether it's an inner kind of brain dysfunction or whether it's a dysfunction and kind of the, the you know, maladaptation. Uh, I don't want to say that because I think that, I think that there are going to be some situations where you have a, a mental disorder a form of madness that does represent a kind of hybrid, some aspects of it, represent a dysfunction, others represent a strategy. I guess I'd be really hesitant to try to, to say, well, really all madness involves some kind of disorder, but maybe there's some kind of subset where you could kind of see as a strategy too. I mean, it seems to me something like where you have Ness's view of depression, depression is just 
there's no dysfunction, disorder at all. Uh, it's literally just something doing exactly what it's supposed to do. It may seem surprising to us, or it may be something that we don't like, or we find somehow unpleasant, but, you know, a lot of things, I mean, childbirth is unpleasant, but it's not a dysfunction. So I guess I, I want to, I want to kind of insist that we should be open to the idea that there are some forms of madness that might be kind of pure strategies and trying to describe them in some way or another as disordered, dysfunctional would really be to kind of stretch the paradigm too much. But those are just I, thoughts I, off, okay, off Thank hand. you, yeah. No, no, I'll save the other question to a little bit, but I, I guess just one final thought. I guess I'd want to now know how to distinguish between mad strategies and non-mad strategies. You know, if I decided just to go through life as a mute on unemployment benefits. You know, if I just decided to drop out, for example, that, that might not be mad, but it might be certainly a strategy. And yeah, uh, yeah. And I don't have a, I'm, uh, yeah, and I don't have a full on definition for either. Like, I don't have a complete definition. Here's what, how did, what madness is on this. So if I say, well, it's a strategy. I mean, clearly there are a lot of things that people do that are strategies that aren't madness. So there's got to be some additional differentiating feature. And I don't, I don't know, you know, what that, what that is yet. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So um, on that, there is a follow up from uh, Peter Zakhar saying that strategy is more agentic than a decline in function that happens to people. Mm -hmm. um, and we have the next question from Richard Saville Smith. I agree with that point, by the way, there's some, some uh, quality of agency associated with the notion of strategy. Uh, that doesn't exist in dysfunction. And I like, I think it's a good thing uh, to kind of restore some sense of agency. We're not talking about conscious strategies, but there's still a sense of uh, a, a preserved sense of agency. This is something on some level I have had to do in order to deal with these experiences. And I think that that ideally would be a positive and affirming kind of quality to it. Thank so, you. Yeah. <laughs> In the chat, <laughs> you know, question, comment. Thank you for your talk. That was very interesting. Um, I'm, what I'm, I'd like to pursue this strategy business a little bit further is that when you talk about madness and strategy, the way I hear it, which may not be the way you mean it, but the way I hear it is that it's some kind of coping or defensive strategy that individuals um, engage with in order to survive or you know whatever like this and i was wondering if you wanted to address a kind of wider idea that madness as a strategy might have a socially constructive function in terms of actually um be contributing to the you know the development of humankind you know you can take burns and nickels and so on and so forth uh, but you can also take you know the from idea of madness as breakthrough rather than breakdown you know, the idea that madness might in itself be a capacity that some individuals have in order to engage in a kind of, well, I don't know, for the sake of it, a greater epistemological understanding of reality as they find it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great, I think that's a great point. Uh, and when I, yeah, when I use the term, uh, the notion of madness as strategy, it's supposed to be a very all-encompassing notion. It's not just I think one very common modern understanding is that this is a coping strategy. It's a way of dealing with bad that's why I'm, that's why I'm <laughs> resisting. And that's that, that's not the notion. I think madness as strategy is a much broader idea. It includes okay. anything where I think in some ways the essence of it is that somebody who accepts this paradigm madness as strategy, the first question that they're going to have when confronting somebody who's mad in some senses, what's the purpose of this? Not what went wrong, but what is this form of madness trying to achieve? That is the most general sense. And one specific- yeah, But does that, excuse me, may I, is it, does that not infer or imply some kind of intentionality about it, which uh, presupposes that one starts off with a strategy, whereas the strategy in itself might actually be, uh, you know, more something that is constructed you know, when yeah. coming down, as it were. I don't think so. I don't want the strategy, the notion of strategy. And I, you know, I wish I could find a better word. I, I would say madness is teleology, but I think just think that's going to be confusing uh, in its own right. Uh, but I think strategy, I don't mean to 
restrict it to a conscious or even conscious, uh, unconscious kind of strategy. So there's, you know, you go back, say, to Burton and some of the Renaissance thinkers, Manus is a divine strategy. It's God's strategy. It's not even your own strategy. Yeah. When you get to people like Heinroth and, and uh, Frieda Fromm Reichmann, it is a coping strategy. It's a coping mechanism. But I think that when you get to people like Lang and some of the anti-psychiatrists, yeah. they see man as, as a kind of strategy for transforming society. You know, they see it as a strategy for political revolution. And so I, I think that they fall comfortably within this kind of broad understanding of Manus's strategy. They're seeing first and foremost, a certain purpose being served. And I guess in that case, I mean, one problem that Lang was dealing with is that a lot of the mad patients uh, didn't necessarily know that they were political revolutionaries and they had to be instructed. He had to instruct them or the other patients had to instruct them that they're political revolutionaries. And so they had to kind of wake up uh, gradually through some kind of a healing process to this to this greater mission. So yeah, I would I would hope to use the notion of strategy broadly enough. And uh, you know, what, one thing I try to do with the history is is try to show that there are so many different manifestations that this notion of madness is strategy. It is one thing. There is a common essence. I'm not just throwing things together haphazardly. But there is a, a, a this notion of strategy it just manifests itself so differently in so many different eras. It's divine strategy. It's coping mechanism. It's strategy for political revolution. I, I hope that that helped to answer your your question. Indeed, I have another question. But like Richard, I'll sit back for someone else. Yeah, thank you. Maybe we will go back to it uh, after. So next question is from Camilo Enrique Sanchez. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry my camera isn't working. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I would like to ask a two part question. Um, the first part is thinking about the hypothesis of the of understanding madness as a strategy. Wouldn't it that be a structured by presupposing a kind of neglect of the health issue as medular of madness? That's the first part. The second part is if that is so, wouldn't it that a, also try to neglect the main conceptual problem to define madness? Thank you. So, thank you. Would you just restate the first one? You're saying, doesn't the notion of madness as strategy presuppose, and I, I didn't catch, it's just the, the audio yes. quality. Yes, presuppose a kind of neglect of the health issue involved as medular in madness. It's a neglect of the health issue. Yes, as, as a main issue to understand madness. I see. Madness's strategy somewhat divorces it from the concept of health. I mean, I, I guess I would have to think about that more. I'm, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to just think of it, like, would the notion of Madness's strategy, it would neglect, it would neglect the idea that, it would neglect the issue of health. I guess, how would it neglect the issue of health? I mean, in some cases, like somebody like Felipe Pinel thinks that uh, these forms of madness are actually vital, you know, uh, on the road to health. They're, they're vital pathways to health. When somebody is distressed or traumatized or even sick, uh, sometimes a form of madness can be the thing that gets them healthy again. And certainly, you know, back in the Renaissance times, maybe it wasn't so much thought of in terms of health, but I, or I think health and, and the notion of virtue and vice were connected in, in such a way that for Burton or Cheney, uh, madness is a way of getting you back on the road of virtue when you've been languishing in, in, in vice. But I'm not sure if that addresses what, what you really yeah. wanted. I would like to add just something. Um, I was thinking about 
if you're understanding madness as a strategy, as a coping mechanism, what is presupposed, I think, but you correct me, is that if you're coping with something, there has to be always a specific individual difficulty that the individual is trying to cope with. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was thinking about, well, if this is a strategy, wouldn't it that leave behind or try to leave behind the difficulty as a health issue that it's a, essential to the, to, to, to the conception, to this a fuzzy conception of madness. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so when you say madness is a strategy, even though you're trying to move away from this kind of disease, deficit, dysfunction viewpoint, you're still saying there's something, when you think of it like a coping strategy narrowly, you're still saying, look, there's something that's gone terribly wrong yes. that the person is trying to deal with. And so you're still kind of, is that it? You're still kind of putting it within this context of trauma, disability, you know, something terrible. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I think that is, I mean, I was just saying uh, to, um, I think it was Richard who, who asked the question before you, uh, um, sorry, if I don't see the names right now, um, that I want the notion of strategy to be taken in a more broad sense. So if somebody like Lang sees madness as a strategy of political revolution, but the problem to which a, it's a solution uh, is the problem of society and, and the violence of society of Vietnam, of better dead than red, of, you know, just the, the madness of society is the thing that alleged madness is supposed to be a kind of uh, uh, response to. But yeah, there is always a sense of your madness as a strategy of dealing with an unpleasant situation. And I do think in a way, you know, when people talk about neurodiversity, I think that's in some ways very different from talking about madness as strategy. Because if somebody says, you know, autism isn't a disease, it's just a different way of thinking or some aspects of autism aren't diseases, they're not pathogenic, they're just different cognitive styles. And you have to respect those cognitive styles just as much. I don't really take that as, a, as an instance of madness's strategy, but just as a way of saying, look, there are a number of different ways to be normal, and this is one way to be normal. So let's not. Uh, so I think that, that there are a lot of different ways to start moving away from a medical paradigm, whether it's madness's strategy is one way. It could be that neurodiversity represents a very different uh, but, way. Uh, but I just the just the last thing but i think that that could um, be problematic in the sense that it could um, lead us to disregard the main conceptual question of what is madness mm. yeah yeah i i understand yeah i see i see what thank you very much uh -huh. okay we uh, have a written question so i'm going to read it um it's from isis seren kaipak what could you say about anti-psychiatry movement and your theory and about rise of psychiatry as a new form of religion or a way of finding meaning in postmodern world? Wow, <laughs> that's a heavy, a heavy question. Uh, what do I say about anti-psychiatry? I mean, I know a little about that and I think that that you know, as, as I was saying, I think that anti-psychiatry does fall fairly neatly within the purview of what I'm calling uh, madness as strategy in the sense you're seeing more of a political strategy. You're seeing more of a, the mad person is kind of a revolutionary. They might not understand that yet, uh, but they are. And what they're offering us is a kind of strategy for moving away from fascism, from the violence of society, so I think that anti-psychiatry fits pretty neatly into the madness of strategy. The second part I wasn't so sure about, you said psychiatry as a new religion that gives us a sense of meaning. There are a lot of things that I think of with that. I don't know if you'd want to, to, to clarify. Would you that. like to, to say something uh, about that? Maybe in written... Um, 
if um, by the time you, you, you type, if you're writing, we can take the next question, if that's okay. Um, how do you feel about that, Justin? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, so, I know some people do, sorry, I mean, I just connect, say, you know, some people do connect madness with spirituality in some ways, you know, potential shamanism, or maybe the idea that somebody who is mad is having, not that they're a shaman or that they would be a shaman somewhere else, but they're having experiences that if in other parts of the world would have led them on that track, you know, and would have led them to give them, but I don't know if that's the kind of thing that we're, we're talking about here. Thank you. So uh, the next one is from Urte Laukaitait. I'm, I'm sorry if I'm probably mispronouncing uh, your name. Would talking about something along the lines of adaptive response work here to avoid the intentionality worry? I think it was about a question that was asked earlier. This could capture the notion that some kinds of madness are perfectly adaptive responses to really unhealthy life circumstances, for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that would be good. I think adaptive response would also be a good way of summarizing uh, what I'm calling madness as strategy. Just doesn't sound as good to me. Madness as adaptive response. I just like madness as strategy. I, I think it has a simple kind of nice ring to it, but I think that madness as adaptive response Generally, I think that's that would be the case. I, I, I think that would work adaptive response to a sick society or an adaptive response to something, you know, a trauma or adaptive response to maybe even some breakdown in some other part of the mind. I think that's good. You could, I mean, the only thing uh, is it would be historical. I wanted to link my view to the earlier viewpoints like, uh, you know, Burton and, and Cheney, where they think of madness as as God's strategy. God is giving you madness or allowing it to happen to, as a strategy to get you to turn away from a certain vice. I mean, it's a kind of, it's God's adaptive response to your sin-ridden life or some, something like that. I, I guess that could work. Yeah. But I'm going to keep madness as strategy. I, just, I like it. I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm used to it now. Thank you. Um, there is a comment on that from Richard Gibbs uh, saying, I don't want me to read it. All right. So it, it is in the chat for um, further reading. Uh, there is a question written from Rebecca Bay. Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Would you comment on the issue of madness and gender? Uh, how female madness is often understood as out of control, hysterical, while male uh, madness is often attributed to sociopathy. That's that's a fascinating thought. I mean, honestly, I've never I've never thought about it that deeply. I don't really think that I have anything deep to say about historically how men and women or males and females have been treated differently. How madness has been construed, you know, in a systematically different way. Uh, it, 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 that sounds correct that a male psychopathy, the kind of cold reason, you know, is like the defining feature of some forms of madness, whereas for uh, a woman, hysterical outbursts, uh, I mean, it's certainly obvious when you, when you look through history. So one thinker that I, I, got, I really, uh, uh, I wrote some about and got very interested in is Edward Jordan, back in the Middle Ages, uh, writing around the same time as Burton, who really, in, he didn't invent the category of hysteria, but he brought it to a new prominence in, in England. Uh, and he was one of the witch skeptics. He was one of the people who was very skeptical of witchcraft explanations of demon possession explanations. And he said, here, I have a great explanation uh, for all of these uh, phenomena that are often dealt with by exorcists and thought of as demon possession. It's this new disease that I've discovered called hysteria or the suffocation of the mother, which involves the uterus moving around the body and disrupting various organs. Uh, and it was perfectly clear that this was only a disease uh, in women. So there are, in my research, there have been some very overtly gender-based um, 
uh, diseases. I guess a lot of the people that I've looked at haven't emphasized that so much, you know, like somebody like Frida from Reichman or uh, uh, Griesinger, you know, I'm thinking of various people who just didn't, didn't really emphasize that, but I, I think it's worth, worth pursuing. I wish I had something <laughs> really interesting to say. Thank you. Anne-Marie has the next question. Yeah, thanks, Justin, for your talk. Um, I think I have a question about clarification, especially by the connection that you want to draw between uh, mad resistance and madness as strategy. So uh, I was wondering how madness as strategy can really contribute to, to give an account of madness outside of the uh, medical understanding, especially because in the talk, you referred to fever as an analogy, like it would be a strategy to help us heal. And the way I understand fever is it's a symptom of a disease. And I think it relates a little bit to Camilo's um, earlier uh, question. And so I was just wondering um, if you could say a little bit more about how it helped us to, to develop another conceptual or intellectual picture of madness outside of the medical uh, domain if uh, some kinds of strategy are more like fever and then medical uh, condition. I see. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. And, and um, excuse me. So madness is strategy. I mean, the first point is it's just, it's, it's, to me, it's like the exact antithesis of madness as dysfunction. So at least uh, my project and Mad Pride kind of share a common foil or a common opponent that we're both moving away from. But then what more can be said about the more positive side of that? Okay, how should we now think about our identity now that we've moved past to this thing called uh, dysfunction? And I definitely don't want to, when I talk about Pinel in his likening this certain form of madness to fever, I don't want that I understand what you're saying when you're saying, look, Pinel is still very much in a biomedical perspective. Fever, after all, is a medical condition broadly <laughs> construed. It's not the dysfunction, it's the response to the dysfunction, but it is a, an adaptive response to a specific bodily uh, dysfunction. And I certainly don't want that to be the only picture of what Manus's strategy is. And you're right, it wouldn't always be appropriate or useful for mad pride or mad resistance, trying to think outside of that, um, outside of that paradigm. But then think about something like, and this is what uh, Rashad talks about in his book, uh, which, which there's a very natural resonance between this idea of a survivor narrative and the idea of madness as strategy, where one direction that mad pride, mad resistance has gone is to look at the um, symptoms or the disorder as a strategy for dealing with either trauma or as a strategy for just dealing with day-to-day -day social injustice. It's just some people are sensitized to social injustice and aware of it in such a way that they've had to build up a kind of shell of you know, whether that just be anxiety, depression, even hallucinations. And so there, I think the more, let's, you're right. Forget about the fever analogy. That was, that was just, that was just Pinel's own way of kind of thinking about this. But I think when you try to construe the notion of strategy more broadly, you do see a natural resonance with some ideas in mad resistance but that's not the only idea. I'm not saying that that's the only way to think about madness. And there are very different ways like neurodiversity or madness and spirituality. But there the benefit is not only are you getting this idea of madness as a strategy, but I'm also helping to articulate that it's been part of this longstanding tradition. It's been around for a long time. And you have all these texts and thinkers you know, from history that you can kind of draw upon in really articulating this this idea. Thank you. So uh, are there written questions? Uh, one from Vanessa Paré. I wonder how to reconcile this concept and still accompany people who experience madness. As a mad person, it is difficult to advocate for oneself in the face of the world 
demanding to neutralize these types of strategies, how to promote agency and not forget the difficulties the individual experiences behind the greater picture? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a wonderful question. And if, uh, you know, I would want to, I mean, then my first thought is that, you know, if, uh, if Ginger Hoffman were right here or Mohammed uh, Rashad, maybe they're here, I would just say, okay, why don't you answer that? Because you think very deeply about how can I implement this in a more practical way to help change people's uh, 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 perspectives? I mean, I would, I would hope that there are two aspects. So one, I would hope, and this is something somebody, Peter Zakhar, I think mentioned it in the chat, that it is the notion of strategy is meant to have the kind of resonance of agency, of conferring agency on the mad person and saying, this is something, not necessarily something I'm doing, you know, consciously, but this is a strategy uh, that on some level is helping me to accomplish a certain uh, goal. I would hope that that would restore a certain sense of agency, that the notion of strategy would not come with the idea of, oh, so it's your fault. You're doing this on purpose. This is some kind of uh, little thing that you're trying to do to get uh, attention. I would hope that strategy would have more of the, resi uh, the, the, the resonance of, of agency purpose. And then is, is that I, that's not real, real helpful. Uh, but the second part with how do you also do justice to the pain associated with madness, to the terror sometimes associated with madness. Uh, and there, when I, when I describe something as a strategy, I'm not necessarily saying when I say madness is a strategy to reach an end. So think about Frida Fromm Reichman. For her, it's very clear that madness is a strategy from withdrawing from certain kinds of traumatic experiences. That doesn't mean it's a strategy that always works. That doesn't mean that it's a strategy that always has good results. And in fact, it often, not always, but often has terrible results. It has some good results, like it protects you from being rejected, but it also has some terrible results because it makes you totally unable to kind of navigate around in a normal society. Uh, and so I think you can do, I, I think this idea of madness as, as strategy or think about, you know, Randolph Ness and the idea of depression as a kind of evolved strategy for helping you to detach from an unrealistic life goal. Depression is awful and it can lead to a lot of really terrible things that need to be addressed and need to be sometimes treated. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's not a strategy. It's just a strategy that sometimes has negative um, uh, repercussions. I know that neither of those are great answers to, to your good question, but yeah, I'll have to just think more about it. Thank you. Um, I think I'll take what will be the last question and then we still have comments in the chat that can be saved by clicking on the three dots and saving the chat if you want. Um, so last question from Keiao Yang. Could you say a bit more about your account's implication on mental illness treatments, medications, some common forms of psychotherapy such as cognitive behavioral therapy? What are they treating? how and why clinical trials show they are effective? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. So I'd like to maybe say something about implications for treatment very generally. Uh, um, I mean, as far as what's the right, okay, now that we've taken your view on board, what's the right way of treatment? You know, I don't have any pat answer to that. I think sometimes medication is absolutely appropriate to help somebody. Even if depression is, a, you know, a, a, a strategy for, um, uh, you know, detaching from unrealistic life goals, uh, in some cases, medication can absolutely help to get somebody to the point where they can, you know, start thinking through and talking through uh, what's going on in their lives. So I certainly have no objection to uh, medication as such. Uh, I have no objection to the, you know, hospitalization is sometimes absolutely 
uh, necessary. So I don't object to some of these uh, traditional and, and, and sometimes invasive uh, uh, responses, invasive responses. I guess if there is a main therapeutic implication, and I'm going to leave this pretty general because I'm not a therapist and I don't want to give you know anybody specific therapeutic advice. But if you look historically, one theme, one implication for treatment that comes up again and again in this paradigm of what I'm calling Manus' strategy is that if something, if a certain aspect of Manus or a certain kind of symptom is actually a strategic response, if it's a, an adaptive response to something else going on, either inside the person or outside the person, you don't want to target it as if that's your enemy. You don't want to target it, target it as if that's the thing uh, that needs to be uh, that needs to be stopped. So sometimes with delusions, people describe delusions as potentially strategies for dealing either with stressful situations, strategies potentially even for dealing with maybe perceptual abnormalities. Some people think that uh, delusions associated with schizophrenia could in fact be reasonable responses to certain kind of low level perceptual abnormality. It is their very best way of making sense of, a, of the world if there are say hallucinations uh, involved. They're just trying to make sense of it well enough to move on. So I would just say that one general implication that almost everybody seems to acknowledge with the madness of strategies, you know, and, and Freud, don't treat the function, don't call the function a dysfunction, because if you do, you might target the wrong thing. If you think that the delusions themselves say are the dysfunction, <laughs> that might lead you to start pummeling them with uh, medication or therapy where, as it turns out, the delusions weren't actually the, the problem. Uh, but yeah, uh, that said, I, I don't have any objection to the use sometimes of uh, targeted use of medication or hospitalization when it's when you got to do it. You just got to do it. Thank you very much, uh, Justine Carson. And thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. Um, I would like to remind you that our next session is going to be in two weeks. Um, we will hear Camilla Kong about the phenomenology and ethics of P-centricity in mental capacity law. So I invite you all to register on our website if it's not done already. And um, thank you again, Justin. Uh, we can uh, continue the, the conversation by um, contacting each other with the, the, the chats and the names in the chats. Uh, sorry, we couldn't continue. There are questions that haven't been asked and answered, but we have to, to, uh, to stay on time. So uh, thank you, everyone. Sarah, would you just send me the chat? The the chat. I can't. I don't. I'm I'm dumb. I don't know how to. So the uh, you can just click. I'm I'm gonna say it so so other people can do it too. Um, you you can actually click on chat at the bottom of your screen. Oh, I see. And then um, there is a a window opening on the right of your screen and three little dots that you can click on, and then there you can save chat. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Is that working? Yeah, got it. Okay, great. So thank you, Justin, and thank you, everyone. <laughs>